let's see. Okay, how about now? Give me a little bit of time to see if you can hear me out. Check, check. How's it going, Matt? Man, I think he's wigging out. It's very strange. Now, let's see, let me know about audio, if it's any better. Oh, they had sound, they can hear you. Seems like it works. And that keeps whacking out. Okay, so let's see. Let me try one more thing on my, my overhead camera. I don't know what this deal is. Five people. That's pretty cool. All right. So maybe it's somewhat better. Let's see. Some people are saying the audio is not clear. We'll try one more thing on the audio really quick. I may have to just roll with it. Let's see. Okay, so now let me know if the audio is any better for folks out there listening. Audio, Kyle says the audio is okay, but we tried a different one. If, if you can hear me, please <coughs> say yes, I can hear you in the chat. And let me know if you think the audio is better or not. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everybody.
Awesome. Man, thanks for all these people help me out. Really appreciate it. I'm going to take a mental note of these settings here so we don't. Uh, let's see here. Microphone, that's what I thought. All right. So, um, thank you, everybody, for attending. I'm glad the audio is better and um, there's a little bit of delay, but I think that's standard for these online systems. Now, when it comes for discussion this week, um, there's just a few topics that I wanted to talk about at first and to try to get people woke up and um, uh, get their brain going. Um, and then there's a few things that I think everyone uh, that, that would address some of the questions that people had in the past. Now, in class, we've been talking about shear and reinforced concrete beams. Um, and shear is something that a lot of people have questions about. Also, if you have a question that you would like me to talk about, then this would be a good time for you to post it into the chat or at least have it ready. So there's gonna be not that long um, coming up where I say, hey, do you have any questions? Cause I don't have a ton to talk about today that um, is already already prepared. Um, if, if you have a question that you want me to cover, it would be time to get it ready get it ready and then don't flood us with it yet, but get it ready. And it wouldn't be hurt to put it in the chat and then you could you could post it again coming up. But one thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to shear and reinforced concrete members, this is something that a lot of a lot of people struggle with. A lot of people have have challenges with that um, shear, we, we like to think of shear as something that is um, in the same way that we were taught with mechanics, classical mechanics. And I'm not saying those things are, are wrong, but there's kind of a different way to think of shear inside um, concrete members. And this, this kind of different concept, if you can kind of get it in your brain, get it figured out, it helps you understand a lot of different things when it comes to reinforced concrete. For example, um, there is, if I have, um, we talked a lot about or in my class, we talked about if you have a point load that's very, very close to the edge of a member, then and if that ACI says that if that point load is within about D of the edge of the member, D, um, and then we can ignore it. We can just uh, ignore any loads that are within D, any shear that's within D, and we can design for the shear that's D away. And that might seem kind of strange for people. There's a video about it uh, um, on my channel, but they're kind of weird about how that works. Like, what, what's that all about? Well, what's really going on is that point load is actually, um, we could call it strutting, or we could call it directly transferring to the support. And um, this direct strut is pretty strong in compression. And what, what, what we'll find is that within concrete, we can keep this same concept, this strut concept, this kind of truss concept going, uh, that even, even with a point load here, instead of using the conventional ways that you've thought about solving for shear, finding your V sub C and your V sub S, and figuring out how much capacity it, it provides, there's something, there's a technique called a strut and tie model where you can envision a truss inside the concrete, envision this truss forming. And in this truss, you would have areas that were in tension, and those would be those would be the areas where you need your steel. Like there's tension down here at the bottom, and actually these members, these vertical members, would also be in tension. This would be in tension. This would be in tension. This would be in tension, and then the the bottom members are all all at tension. And these other members are in compression, 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 compression. Now, why this is helpful 
is that you can use these to solve really complicated problems. You don't necessarily need these for simply supported beams, but if you have like a really complicated problem, um, like let's just say a beam, uh, a, a pretty classic problem is um, a beam with a hole in it. You might say, wow, does that ever happen? Do you ever get beams with holes in it? Sure you do. People want to run um, electrical. They want to run HVAC systems. They want to do whatever. And what you can do in problems like this is that you can envision trusses inside the member. You can envision this load being distributed by trusses. Maybe you'd have a truss at the top. Maybe you would have a truss at the bottom where you'd maybe this load would maybe come down to here and strut and then maybe you would have some of the load come up here to a strut and then you would draw a truss over here and then you, you could have a truss over here as well. You can have a truss that goes down, goes over, something like that. This concept is called a strut and tie model. Strut and tie model. And this is really powerful for these very challenging structures. Um, some examples may be a, um, a structure like this, and you would say, well, what is the, what is the truss going to look like over here? Uh, you, you could, there's lots of ways to do these trusses. Um, and trusses are not something you're probably that comfortable with because you probably don't use them that often um, or design them that often. There's... And the, the simple way I can tell you that I know this sounds like it's going to sound insane, like this is going to sound like totally, totally crazy. But the simple way, the simple explanation is, is that any truss that you choose that doesn't violate going through the outside walls of the structure and provides enough capacity in compression and in tension will be fine. And you, that, that is very hard for people to process and people to understand. So believe it or not, the trust you choose doesn't matter that much, at least as far as safety goes. Um, if you choose a really wacky trust, then you can get lots of cracking, but even then you will have a safe structure. And I've got several papers I've published on this. There's lots of people that, that do this, and this is actually a technique people use in the um, ACI 318 um, uh, building code. But... If, if you have stru other structures where this is this is helpful, it's not only just beams with holes in it, it's basically any place you break down the fundamental functions or the fundamental assumptions of a simple supported beam. Um, so some other examples would be um, something like a corbel. So a corbel is where you have a column and then you have... kind of a support where you may, you may put a beam right here. There may be a beam coming in here. You may have a bearing pad that that beam sits on and that provides a load to that point. And what you can do is you can envision a truss or a series of trusses that work within this corbel to transfer the load. That's a very, very simple truss. This would be compression. This would be at the top would be tension. And you would just make sure that you have enough steel there and you have enough compression capacity in this strut so that the system is going to be satisfactory. So that, that is a common one. Another common one is a DAPT beam where you have a beam where at the end it's actually got a DAP in it. It's actually dropped. You can say, why would you do something like that? Well, if you're in a parking garage and you want to save space where this is maybe, maybe you'll bring your corbel. Hey, that's the corbel. It's the same thing we just drew to the left. Maybe you have a corbel over here. And you want to provide as much clearance as you possibly can so that the cars or the trucks or the whatever doesn't hit the beam. 
So by drop by dapping this, you just saved this distance in the total overall height. That's very powerful. Um, but in this situation, you're still going to need a, you're going to develop some kind of truss system. This cannot be handled in the classic way that we do our beams. This some of the assumptions that we make when it comes to shear totally breaks down. And what you have to do instead is envision your own truss inside the member and then find enough tension uh, that's reinforcing steel to go where the tension is. Make sure your compression struts have enough area and concrete strength to take their loads and then the system works. Um, this is kind of a complicated uh, subject and it takes several lectures to kind of explain all the ins and outs of how it works. But this is kind of a broad sense, something that you can understand at this level from what you have. And what I would say the most important thing to understand is when do you need it? When do you need a strut and tie model versus just using the classic um, beam design with shear? And that is a great question. And the simple answer is that when very strange things happen in your cross section, when your cross sections are, are widely disturbed, and that's actually called a disturbed region, that's where the concepts of typical beam behavior don't apply anymore. You're like, man, you're not helping me. You're telling me a bunch of words I don't understand. Let me try to explain it in a different way. If I have a classic beam, There are regions, and actually that D is a very, very good estimate. Where we call them disturbed regions or D regions, capital D, capital D. They're near supports. They're near where weird things happen. They're near where changes in cross-section. There, It's when something strange in the neighborhood who you're gonna call you know usually you yell ghostbusters but here we yell strut and tie modeling right that's a key region for strut and tie modeling and in these regions in the typical plan plan sections remain plain this is where we call it a b region and this is where you use your normal everyday methods now if you are a typical beam designer um, ACI and other places have made it easy for you to say, guess what? You don't have to worry about this because this is going to suck up the load. The load is going to directly strut right there. You don't have to worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. It's super strong. And what they teach you is how to design these regions, these regions here. And that, so you can use classic design in most regions and then in only certain circumstances do you need this strut and tie modeling and in typical beams you don't you don't really need it because they're usually so strong you, you can ignore it usually there are some cases where that's that's not right but they're they're kind of rare but in case, cases like adapt beam that's not a constant cross-section it changed something like a um a corbel the cross section changed. It changed suddenly. That's like a trigger. That's like a, whoa, what is going on? Like, this is different. If I have a hole, this is like constant cross section and then it changes. And then so how do I handle it? So theoretically, um, if the dimensions are right, you could use classic methods over here and you would only need a strut and time modeling on one side. Usually though, it's something like this. If I have to make a truss on one side, I, I go ahead and make a truss on the other side to make sure my system's in balance. So there's a lot of different concepts there, but this is like the next level when it comes to shear, understanding this. This is what separates people from an entry level designer and someone that is much more experienced. And this is something that's typically covered in an advanced reinforced concrete class. Um, again, I've got some papers on it. There's lots of information out there and I'd love to make some YouTube videos on it in the future, but I've got a lot of other ones to make first. I wanna see 
what the now that is what I've got on strut and time modeling and um, see if there's any questions so far this would be your chance to start nailing me um, with your questions so here's one saying he's a concrete freak thank you b -Rad. I appreciate that I'm a concrete freak as well Ah, Kyle just asked the question. Kyle says, when placing our stirrups, and this kind of goes into the same concept, Kyle. He says, when placing our stirrups after calculating our spacing, do we want to start at D or do we start at the support? So Kyle is basically asking, how do you handle this D region? He's saying, do you need any stirrups in this D region at all? Or could you go without stirrups? Now, theoretically, in the way the ACI um, 318 manual is, is written, that you don't need any stirrups in this region, theoretically. Um, what I typically do is I will um, put at least one stirrup over here. And if I have a stirrup spacing that I've calculated, let's just say number four is at eight inches, then I will continue that stirrup spacing all the way to the edge on both on both sides. That's what I'll typically do. So I'll try to put a stirrup in here, at least one stirrup in this zone right here. Awesome. Let's see what else other questions we got. So this question says, is there any major differences between ACI design methods and Euro codes? That, that's a great question. I am not an expert on the Euro code, and so I'm not going to really comment on that. I can tell you that um, that physics is the same, and then how people decide to handle the physics in their design methodologies is up to them and kind of what they want to do. So from what I understand, um, my limited understanding is that the European design methods have more of a canned response for this, and they don't allow as much flexibility as the ACI code does. But I, I could be off on that, and I, there could be more advanced methods that I just don't know about. All right, so I'm looking for more questions. And so now this would be a time. So here's a question Norman asked. He said, would those internal pockets be given radiuses or are they usually sharp corners? So I think what he's talking about is in a situation like this or possibly a situation like this. He said, what would you do? And what, what Norman is concerned about is that this is a stress concentration, that corner break right there. And he's concerned about a crack forming and coming off, off that. And he wants to know kind of what you should do about it. That, that's a great question. That's something I didn't talk about. Um, when you lay out situations like this, you always have to interpret, especially when things get strange, when you have different openings and things like that, you have to think about where, is there tension there? Does that want to open? And usually there is. If you draw, if you draw a truss, there usually is tension right there. So one of your trusses would would usually go somehow put a, a, a tension member down here. That means you're going to want to put steel there. That means you're going to want to put steel across that to try to keep that crack as small as you possibly could. Now you can chamfer those and round those. And I think that's a great idea, and I think that would help reduce the stress concentration. But even, even if you have a change in the cross-section and you have tension in that region, then you will want to get a crack. And really, the only way to, to stop that crack from structural loading is to put a bar across that crack to try to keep that crack as small as possible. You also want to move that bar as close as you can to the face, but be careful because you have cover that, cover requirements that you have to meet. So if you get that bar too close, you may not meet the cover requirements. So that's something that you, you want to pay attention to and uh, keep in mind. It's like a balancing act. Most of concrete is a balancing act. That's, that's a perfect example. Uh, let's see here. What other we got? Arnold asks, what happens when our fee factor is smaller than... 0 0.005. I think Arnold, what you're what you're meaning to ask is, um, in beam design, in beam design, um, there is a check that you have to do at the very end to see if the strain in your steel 
is less than 0 0.005. That's a check that you have to do. And there is actually, uh, we'll find it in the notes here, textbook that we make for our class. There is actually a um, series of, there's a set of equations you end up using. Let's see. I'm looking for something really quick in our notes. And here it is. So this is a, a digital textbook that we make for our that I, we've made for our class. Um, I had help from a student to do it, Awab. Thank you, Awab, for your help. I appreciate that. And if you remember on page 52 in the digital textbook, um, we talk about what happens when your strain's at different places, and we talk about safety factors. These cats are supposed to be safety factors at different amounts. Really, in summary, what, what comes down to is, is, is this. Um, this chart is, is everything. If your strain in your steel is less than 0 0.005, then you will actually use a um, fee factor that's less than 0.9. You have to use linear interpolation to find that, or I think the equation's given over here on the side. So if you found out a strain that was like 0.004, you would put it in the equation, and that <laughs> means you would get a different fee factor. So it's pretty common in, um, in building design or in beam design to assume that you have a fee factor you assume that your fee is 0 0.9, but it doesn't have to be. It could be lower than that. So you could solve and find that your fee may be 0 0.8, and all that means is that when you calculate your, your capacity of your member, your fee MN equals fee ASFY times D minus A over two, that, that, that just means that fee right here may not be um, 0.9. It may be 0.8. It may be 0.7. It may be whatever that chart tells you to do. That chart is capped at 0.65, so it won't allow you to go any, any less than 0.65. So that that is one thing that happens when your strain in your steel um, is greater than 0 0.005. And that happens sometimes in T-beams, especially ones where you don't have um, a lot of depth. Let's see. So Dominique asked a question. She says, how do we use the glass and steel load in our final project design? So um, for my class, they're actually designing a um, concrete building, um, a pretty pretty simple, straight, straightforward concrete building. But, you know, you remember the first one you ever did. It's not very simple, not very straightforward, kind of some somewhat challenging. So what happens is, is on the outside walls of a building sometimes, you may have brick in some regions, and then you may have glass or something else in, in um, another region. And usually holding that up is some kind of floor system, some kind of, of uh, beams or columns. So what's common is to put these loads um, on the columns is, is what's common. Or, or you, could put on, you, you could put it on the edge beam and then transfer it to the column. It just depends how the system um, is laid out. But let's just say we have a column that's right here, column column so if and we have a column that's down here and a column that's over here and a column that's over here and if we use our friend um, tributary area to do this then we take our columns and we go halfway in between these two draw our tributary area halfway in between these two we draw our tributary area halfway between these two we draw our tributary area somewhere in here so that is the tributary area for the column that is the material the column is going to take care of. It's going to take up all the load here. It's going to take up any um, outside loads as well, as far as gravity loads go. So if this is um, brick, let's just say over here, brick, and this is glass, glass, then what you do is you find the brick and glass that, that goes onto that column, and you apply it as a point load. So I'm, let me draw. This was a top view. 
let me draw a side view and maybe this will make more sense. So if I draw this column right here, this column, and I'll try to use the same color. So if I draw that column, and now I'm going to draw a floor beneath it and a floor above it. Now, what I'm trying to tell you to do is I'm trying to say, so now my eye is here. Here's my eye looking at this system. So on one side, maybe we have brick. Brick, let's put brick over here. On the other side, we have glass. We put glass over here. And this is our column. These are floors. What we're trying to get it down to is we're trying to find a point load ultimately. We're trying to find, we're trying to turn this complicated system and turn it into something that's much more simpler. Something that has a column that's got a point load here for the top story and a point load here for this story as well. So how do you find the, <laughs> the, these point loads? I'm trying to find this, this basically is a summary of this. This is a summary of this. So how do you find that? Well, you use tributary area again. You just do them in another dimension. So again, if we had a column over here and a column over here, we'd go halfway in between them and draw a tributary area line and draw a tributary area line. And then if we go halfway between these floors, draw another tributary area line, draw another tributary area line. So you would hastily take this entire area, turn it into a point load, and put it here. You would take this entire area, turn it into a point load, and put it here. So brick and glass are treated as, as dead loads, so you would, you would multiply them by the load factors uh, for that scenario, for that case, and put them here. Um, you would include them with any other dead load from the self-weight of the slab, self-weight of other things, or live load in this region, um, you would include that again. All of that, everything here, would get sucked in to that point load. And everything here would get sucked in to that point load. And then you do the same thing below it. Again, for the floor below it, everything here would get sucked in to that point load, and everything here would get sucked in to that point load. Hope that makes some sense. Hey, Brian, thank you so much for the kind words, man. And um, thank you for the work you do at PennDOT. Um, PennDOT's a great organization, and I, I work with them on a lot of different things. And I'm glad you're working there, too. Uh, they're a great group. Uh, Lewis says, as far as I'm concerned, the fee factor only applies to flexure compression, flexure compression. So, Lewis, I'm not sure what flexure compression means to you, but I, I think you're talking about the, the one that I was talking about above. This does only apply to flexure design, um, but there are fee factors for shear. There's fee factors for columns. There's fee factors for strut and tie models. There's fee factors for punching shear. There's, I mean... Every single thing that we use, at least in the ACI 318 building code, we have two different safety factors. We have um, one safety factor when it comes to the load, that's the load factor. We have another safety factor when it comes to the capacity, and that's called the fee factor. And you have to understand both of them to be able to dial in and tune what your safety factor is for your structure. Maybe it's different wherever, whatever building code that you're working on. Let's see. Ah, it's about the fee factor interpolation. Yeah, no, the, the interpolation, you're right, is only used for um, flexure design. Um, there are other fee factors only have a single value, but that doesn't mean in the future that they might change. 
So the reason they changed um, this uh, linear interpolation for uh, flusher design was because it was a, the best way to handle and ensure that you didn't have an over reinforced member. They get they got rid of, of um, row balance and a lot of other concepts to ensure ductility. And I would say, as we understand more systems like shear and strut and tie modeling, that you actually in the future may see more fee, fee factor modifications as people better understand it. Hey, hey, Roger, glad you're having your uh, your facial cleanser. I appreciate it. I do owe you an email, brother, and I'm sorry I've not gotten back to you. It has been a busy time. I look for an email today for me. What else we got? Oh, boy. Mustafa just asked a loaded question. In the moment coefficients, for continuous beams and ACI, how did they find it? And did they assume the beams are fixed? Hmm. Okay, Mustafa, <laughs> I'll answer this question because I, I'm not getting others that I can easily answer um, online. If, if you do have your questions, it is time to get your questions in. I will answer your questions, especially if you're on my, in my class. If you have questions or stuff you want me to talk about, um, and um, then this is the time to get them in. So what Mustafa is asking is a, um, is a loaded question, a very, very challenging question. So what he is talking about is ACI 318 has something that's very, very cool. Um, and I, if I knew exactly where it was in the manual, I would get it out and show you um, what it is. And what Mustafa is saying is that in a situation like this, let me make myself a little bit smaller so you can see what's going on. In, if I have a continuous beam, which is great for my class because you guys are going to be learning how to design continuous beams. I've got some sweet, sweet tricks coming up for you. In a continuous beam, um, the, the, what he's talking about is like if I'm, if I'm going to take a very, very large structure and I'm going to take a piece out of it. So if I have a huge, huge, huge structure over here, structure, 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 and I just grab a piece out of it, just a piece and I blow it up over here. And what ACI has done for you is they've actually found, de depending on these geometries, we'll call this L1, we'll call this L2, and I think they actually have another one where they, you average L1 and L2. They actually give you coefficients for the moments. They have worked out that depending on what these span lengths are and these, the, these different dimensions, They've worked out good estimates for what are the moments at all these different scenarios. You're like, what is he talking about? Well, usually in a problem like this, you would need to actually put something like this in um, a structural analysis program where you could put some kind of supports up here. Pins are usually a good idea um, of some sort, and you may want to pin it at mid-column. Mid-column, yeah, we can talk more about that later if you want. But wherever that mid-column dimension is, that, that's, where, that's where your pin would go. So you would put a situation like this, and um, you would start to put pattern loading. You can imagine putting loadings all over, all over this system, over and over and over, all kinds of different places. And you would solve for what the moments and shears were at all these different locations. What ACI has done is for different combinations, different bay widths, different heights, different whatevers, different pattern loading. They've put all of these in. They've done lots and lots and lots of structural analysis, and they've found, found what's called the envelope, the ones that control for these different scenarios. So they have found what these are for these different scenarios, for the gravity loads at least, of what the moment is here, the shear is, the moment is here, and the shear is. That means instead of doing hundreds and hundreds of structural analysis cases, then you can use this simplified um, uh, ACI approach, and you can find what your moments and shears are at all these different locations, and you can do it really, really rapidly. And this is powerful, and this is really good, and um, this is something that, that can be very, very helpful. Now, one challenge with this, though, one big challenge with this is that this scenario, and this is great for gravity loads, this scenario doesn't take into account anything for lateral loads. That means if I put a lateral load on this system, some kind of wind load coming on the system, I do some kind of earthquake loads or something like that, it doesn't take those into account. It doesn't take into account at all. 
And really the only way to take these into account is to actually put them in a, a structural analysis program and solve for them. Um, and you, there are some hand methods you, you can use as well, but they're pretty cumbersome to do. Um, and so if I'm going to be putting this into a structural analysis program, and if I'm going to be putting my lateral loads on them, then why not go ahead and put my gravity loads on them and solve? Now you might say, well, you don't have to do as many pattern loadings. Well, if you use influence lines, which some people may not know what influence lines are, but if you use influence lines, you can figure out the pattern loadings are really, really, really quickly, really quickly. It's very, very powerful if you understand these things. So I know this is a little bit off what, what we've been talking about, but it is still structural design. It is still ACI 318, and it is still powerful and <coughs> interesting. If anyone happens to find the codes, then uh, that would be awesome. That, or, I'm sorry, the, the page number where that's discussed in the manual, maybe you could share that in the chat. Oh, baby, we got a blast from the past here. Um, my former student, Zane Lloyd, says, in ACI, they discussed reducing the moment of inertia for beams, columns, and slabs. Could, could you provide feedback on situations where this is appropriate? The code seems unclear. Oh, Zane, thank you for that. Um, okay, Zane, um, what this is talking about, what ACI is talking about, is that a lot of times when we calculate our moment of inertia, um, and they, it's mainly for bending, that, at least my experience is mainly for bending, this is not applied for axial load, but mainly for bend, bending, when we calculate moment of inertia, we use the same thing we've done over and over again. We use 1 12th BH cubed plus A D Y squared. 1 12th BH cubed plus A D Y squared. Now that works great. <laughs> That works amazing when the section is not cracked. When the section is not cracked, this works amazing. But now when the system becomes cracked, that um, this whole concept doesn't work anymore, right? Because if I have a member that is in flexure, drawing a cross section here, and I'm, <coughs> I'm drawing a member here, and it's got a load on the outside, at least at the center here, where the load is high um, and the stress is going to be high in the bottom, we would expect it to be cracked. In service loads, we would expect it to be cracked. And you can calculate it where that is. You can find M crack, right, by using something like, um, um, let's see here, MY over I. And you can figure out where your um, M crack is. This is actually be sigma crack, not M crack, sigma crack. The stress when the crack would happen, and you can back solve for that to figure out what that would be what I crack times I over Y would be equal to our M crack. So this, you could use like seven and a half times root F prime C. If you wanted to use that, that's a good estimate for that. You would use your I in there, and you would use your Y in there, and you would figure out this is the moment, the moment that you would need to cause this section to crack. Anyway, <coughs> once it's cracked, you wouldn't expect to be able to use this, right? Because you lost some cross section. So you wouldn't expect to be able to use this. So what can you use? Well, if you remember, um, and you were a former student of mine, and so I don't know if you'll remember, but you'll at least have this um, in your notes. If you went back to the notes from my class when we talked about serviceability, um, one of the calculations in serviceability, one of the things that we did, and hopefully people can see, let's zoom in here, and maybe I can, I'll zoom in, I'll try to zoom in here. Um, Hopefully you can see that equation. That is I effective. I effective. We'll see if we can fix that. Yeah, it's not going to let me fix that to make it more clear. Um, the effective moment of inertia is M crack over M A to the cube times I gross. That is the I without um, any cracking. Right. One minus M crack over M A cubed times I crack. Um, and so you'd have to calculate what I crack is. Um, this is your moment at cracking. This is the moment that you're using at that point in time. 
And you use this equation to tune or dial in um, what your effective mode of inertia is. So equations like this, and there's actually a new one in ACI 318 um, that is supposed to be simpler than that one that I just showed you, but I've looked at it and I'm not sure it's all that simple. Um, and so what that equation does is it helps you tune your structure for how cracked it is. It helps you take into account for how much of the cross section is gonna be cracked. Um, this is helpful when you're gonna put something like this in a structural analysis program, if you care about deflections, and there's a video I just released about that. I didn't talk a lot about this um, in that video because it's, it's kind of complicated, but that's one way you would do it to tune that video, tune, tune your structure to better get your, your um, actual deflections. You would use something called I effective, I guess is what I would say. I effective, and that's an effective moment of inertia that takes into account how high your moment is on your structure compared to the cracking moment. And the higher your moment is, then the more cracking you're, you're, you're going to have and the more discount you're going to have on your moment of inertia in your actual calculations. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, so Lucas has asked several times here, so we'll just let him um, know what's going on. Where in the Dropbox do I submit today's homework? Um, so Lucas, I think there's some, I'll email you this after the live stream um, with a, a, a specific link. Let's see. Aha. Somebody wants to know how the, for the brick and glass example that I had before, how do you deal with the moment loads on the column? The brick and glass would be different weights. Ah, it's a good question. So what they're asking is, in a situation like this, if the brick weighs more than the glass, or the glass weighs more with the brick, how do you handle that? Is that eccentricity? So he, they're saying that this would be a load here, and this would be a load here, and they may be different loads, and they may have different eccentricities. So if this is something that's a big concern to you, like if you really think this is a big deal, you really think those moments are gonna be large, then, I mean, you can actually calculate what those differences in the moments are. Now, from my experience, from lots of different um, um, structures that I've worked on, situations like that usually aren't that big of a deal. But if they are, if you think they are, if you know that they're going to be a big deal, then you would actually calculate what that moment arm would be. You would find not only the, the, the um, resultant point load for this, but you could use this eccentricity and you would find the resultant point load for this and you would find this eccentricity. You would find what the moments are and you would see, do they balance or do they not? And if they don't, if there's a big discrepancy, then you would need to take that into account. Let's see. Let's see. Ali wants to know, can strut and tie modeling be applied to steel beams as well? Sure, it can, Ali. You can apply it to steel. You can apply it to wood. You can apply it to composites. You can apply it to any single member out there that you want to. Um, you just and, and actually, we do it in steel beams all the time. Um, there is uh, a sheer um, calculation now. I'm pushing my steel knowledge here um, on um, there's a web buckling that can occurs in high amounts of shear um, and I can't remember the name of it right now but it's got this it's like shear web buckling or something like that and they actually use strut and tie models on those that's actually how they're derived I do have a video about this on my channel it's in my steel section a lot of you might not know I have a whole bunch of videos on how to design steel beams and steel members as well but they are older um, but maybe you can find it um, maybe we can talk about that later let's see um, gentleman wants to know can we recommend a reference for pre-stressed concrete slab design um, I'm yeah, that's a great question. So I'm a, I'm a big fan when it comes to um, 
um, pre-stressed concrete design, and I believe they have slabs in there. I'm pretty sure they do. I like Nielsen's book, N-I-L-S-S-O-N. -S -S I believe it. I believe there's two S's in there. Um, and um, there's another book out there by um, oh, there's um, uh, there's Burns, I think Lee. And Burns, um, is it Lee? It's, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name. He's a professor at Berkeley for a long time. It was a Lynn, Lynn, T.Y. Lynn, Lynn and Burns. That's a Lynn. Um, those are the two that, that are out there. Um, Burns does have some slabs that he's done, um, actually for slabs on grade um, that, that were pre-stressed that were in Texas. Um, you might be able to search, search um, CTR, Center for Texas Research. I think it's CTR and Burns. And then slabs, like maybe pre-stressed slabs on the internet. And I bet you'll find some, um, some <coughs> uh, reports, research reports, where they've actually designed and built. These are slabs on grade, not slabs in air. Um, but I would look at Lyndon Burns or Nielsen's book. Those are the two ones that I know best. Um, right. Any other preguntas? Quantas preguntas, por favor. Roger, he had a question. He says, I could probably find it. Um, figure the rigidly bracing the steel frames of big buildings would snap the joints in an earthquake, but allowing the center spans can flex without snapping the joints. So I think, Roger, what you're talking about here is, is this concept of um, where are you going to dissipate energy in large um, um, extreme events? And most of the time, what people try to do in, in situations like this um, is at least – in a they'll make something like a very very strong column and then they'll actually force like a, a fuse in the beams they'll actually force like a hinge of uh, a plastic hinge to form in the beams they want their hinges they want these extreme events to happen in the beams and and not inside the columns now when it comes to a truss that's what you were talking about was a truss um this gets a lot more complicated um but in a truss one thing that they can do, I've seen done before at least, is put in a link in the truss um, that that actually dissipates energy. Now that link is, and what is that? If I zoom in on this region, and again, this I don't, I wouldn't say this is used a ton, um, <coughs> but they'll, they'll put something called a shear link in there. That is, um, I, I, I can't believe all the steel questions we're getting today. Um, I, I can't even remember what the, what the detail looks like right now, so I don't want to draw it and get it totally wrong. But what they'll, what they'll do is they'll put a, almost a fuse in that system. So as that system starts to deflect up and down or see, see some, some kind of um, 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 extreme event, that it will either dissipate energy or possibly even fail locally um, at that system. And then the loads will be able to distribute other places. Another concept that they that, that they'll do sometimes is they'll actually um, post tension the members of of the steel truss. So they'll actually put steel wire, steel cables that go in these members. Okay, they actually they're not that long. They're they're anchored here and anchored here. But they'll they'll put so imagine having a member like a, a tube. Um, and they'll put a member, they'll put something in the tube. They'll actually put a cable in the middle of the tube. So if that member starts to buckle for some reason, if that member starts to buckle, that tube actually stops it. And you might, you might not understand what I'm talking about. This may seem really strange. One way you can prove it to yourself or visualize this for yourself is that you can use a straw. Yeah, you know the straw, the one you would drink um, you know, your favorite beverage out of. And um, you can find, cut it down to a length that you can cause to buckle, that you can push on it, you can cause the tube to buckle. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like if I push on it, it's going to buckle up to the side. And in that tube, if you take, um, you can even take like a, um, <clears throat> a piece of uh, rope or a piece of uh, twine or string. And if you run that string through the middle of the tube and you pull it tight, you will not be able to buckle that. 
it won't buckle. Um, it will crush, but it won't buckle. Every time it tries to buckle, that string will actually hold it tight, actually keep it from buckling. That concept is the same things that people people use inside trusses in situations like this to resist extreme events and heavy loads to help dissipate loads. They're that buckling event that allows that member to buckle and then be restrained by that cable and then buckle and be restrained by that cable. And that again, dissipates energy in situations like, like, like trusses and extreme events like earthquakes and also wind loads. So that is, I would say um, a more, um, I, th I think of a, uh, emerging way that people are using to try to dissipate energy in situations like this. All right. What other questions we got here? Yeah. Hey, I appreciate this. Yeah. Using your crack gauge as a ruler. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a crack gauger. Um, so yeah, I'm a big, thank you for noticing that. Um, so Lewis wants to ask, he says, can you talk about construction joints, dilation joints and where to place them? Big fan of your channel. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Lewis. I appreciate that. Um, so let's talk about what these things are. <laughs> so Lewis, if you could give me a little bit more detail, are you, are you talking about beams? Are you talking about slabs? Are you talking about walls? Are you talking about all of them? You know, and I'm afraid you're going to say all of them. And so I'm just going to assume that. Um, that all of them is, is, is what you're talking about. Um, so what Lewis is talking about is that it is impossible to build um, a, let's just talk about a wall. I think a wall is a good way to, a good place to start. It's impossible to build an infinitely long wall. It's totally impossible. That at some point you have to stop. You have to stop building. Um, maybe because you've got to go home and go to bed, maybe because you run out of concrete, maybe because, you know, whatever, you're never going to be able to build like if you're, if you're doing a, let's just put, you know, some massively long wall, mile long wall, you're never going to be able to do the entire thing. So there are places where you would stop that wall on purpose, on purpose. Um, and <clears throat> there's two different labels for those. One of them is called a construction joint. And then the other one is called, um, at least Lewis called it a um, dilation joint. And I think that's a fine name for it. Um, so let's talk about the first one. Let's talk about construction joints first. So if I have a wall and it's super long, goes in this direction a long way, in this direction a long way, and I'm building, I'm building, I'm building, and then I have to stop for that reason, then, then, that is sometimes you can't always put those in, in the most opportune places. Oftentimes, as a designer, what we try to do is provide them advice. We try to say we would like the construction joints to be here. We would like them to be here. But ideally, ideally, the construction joint shouldn't matter where it is. I said ideally, didn't I? So be careful. But ideally, it should not matter where the construction joint is um, because I can provide um, reinforcement <coughs> across this joint. I can provide some amount of reinforcement across this joint because what a construction joint really is, is like a big crack. It's like a crack that's purposely cast, not purposely, what's on, they did it on purpose, but it's cast at a spot inside inside whatever structure you're is. And if you have enough steel that goes through that, it shouldn't matter. Now, let's talk a little bit more about construction joints. <laughs> What's common in my experience, in my practice, um, if I'm a structural engineer and I don't want a construction joint to happen at a certain place, it is my responsibility to tell the builders where that is. It's my responsibility. So, for example, let's say I have a, um, let's say for whatever reason I have a beam that I'm building, and I don't know why they would ever do this. I wouldn't recommend construction joints and beams. Um, wouldn't recommend them at all. Um, but if I have a beam like this, I, I probably would not want a construction joint at the dead center. Probably something I would want to avoid. No construction joints here. 
actually, I probably wouldn't want a construction joint anywhere. But if there's some place that I would be okay, if I had a um, um, maybe somewhere in where there's lower moment regions, I, I, I might entertain that concept. I, I might want to think about that. But truly in a beam, especially one that I want durability in, I'm not putting a construction joint in there. I'm not, I, and I don't want there to be one. And and I need to do everything to do everything they possibly can to avoid construction joints or stopping construction in the middle of that structure. But now, <coughs> um, but but it happens sometimes. It happens sometimes. And what we can do, if for some reason there is a break in work and they have to put a construction joint, there are things that you can do to build more confidence in yourself that that's going to be okay. And we talked about this at last live stream. Um, there's things that you can make them do. Let's say they're building our, our wall here and they come along here and they have to stop. For whatever reason, they have to stop. They have to stop. And um, they have their rebar sticking out, which is great. They have rebar poked in and ready to transfer the load, which is totally amazing. What you can easily have them do is you could have them come back and roughen this surface, okay, with a chipping hammer or <laughs> with shot blasting. There's a lot of different techniques to provide more friction along that boundary. Um, you could require more steel. You could require them to dowel and epoxy in more steel if that's what you need, absolutely positively need and have to have to make you feel, feel more confident. That's a lot of steel, and I don't know if you need that. I think you need, you need to be careful what you ask for because that putting that much steel in that cross-section could cause more, more problems. Um, but there's things that you can do to deal with construction joints. Now let's move into our friend dilation joints. Now, dilation joints are places where you put a, a joint on purpose in the structure where you know it's going to move, where you know it's going to give back and forth. Now, again, as a structural engineer, it is your responsibility to pick where the dilation joints are going to go. So if we have, a, again, our friend, the infinitely long wall, um, and <coughs> you, you're going to want to put dilation joints. These are joints where you think – the structure is either going to um, move or you would put in places where you think it will crack. Um, so you may purposely put in um, areas where you might chamfer in. What's a chamfer? You may purposely, if my eye was above, put in something where I have a wall, I have a wall, and then I'm going to build a known stress riser into that wall. And I'm going to have enough steel across that so that when a crack forms, cracks forming in the plane here, oh, you can't see that. When a crack forms, this is the stress riser that I'm building into the wall. Um, that's steel I'm putting across it. When that crack forms, I'm going to control that. Okay, so that's not a dilation joint either. That's that's a, a place where um, um, you know crack control joint where where you think the crack is going to perform. You want to keep those those, those cracks small. Um, now a dilation joint would be a little bit different detail where um, you would actually want it to move. So you would not put a bar across there. You would come. You would do the exact same thing. Um, you would form it in here, and maybe you would form and even put some expansive material in there. Or maybe you don't even form a, uh, maybe you don't even do this at all. Maybe you just form it flat. Anyway, you put some kind of expansive material, some kind of material in that, in that joint so that as that system moves back and forth, your structure is going to be able to handle it. It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to move. Now, the simple news for all these things is they're all the same. You don't want to put these in places where they're going to compromise your structure. That's what it all comes down to. Don't put these in places that it's going to compromise your structure. If for some reason you have to, they have to, then make them roughen it, make them change it so that you feel confident that you're going to get load transfer across that region. And if there are places in your structure where you absolutely cannot have them, you need to call them out. But I'll tell you what, building <laughs> is complicated. It's not easy. And things happen in the field all the time. And you need to try to work with people. You need to try to be flexible with people to help them build things that are successful for your clients. Um, and so that's my advice is there are ways to handle this. You just have to manage your risk.
Ugh, a lot of stuff there. All right. I'll tell you what. Uh, how are those different from cold joints? Those are um, – so construction joints and cold joints are the same thing. Um, cold joints, so, yeah, there you go. They're the exact same thing. Uh, Sad wants to know, can you explain the interaction curve of some wall with steel reinforcement and concrete grouting? I don't think so. I, if you could ask me a better question, I might be able to do it. Interaction diagrams are something we'll talk about coming up. There'll be some more videos on that coming up, um, hopefully next week. Um, and so maybe that will help answer your question about the interaction diagrams. All right, any other questions from folks? Hey, hey, thank you, Thanos. Hi from Greece, thanks for attending. Beautiful image you've got there. Precast concrete member. Um, any, anybody else? Any other questions people have? Cycling back through here. Let's see if there's anything that I didn't cover. I have Brian said this. Hey, Brian, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm glad you're getting some of something out of this channel. Giving you guys a little bit more time. So Mo says he likes my video. He wants me to use more attractive animation and pictures in your videos. Thanks, Mo, for this question. There's a statement. Um, I'd like to use more um, attractive animation and pictures as well. I try to do the best I can with the time that I have. Um, now, my goal is not to make the most beautiful channel in the world. My goal is to make clear, very clear, very straightforward explanations that are helpful to people to make their lives better. I think making things more attractive sometimes makes people pay more attention to what's going on, but it also costs more time and more, more money. And I don't have time or money at all right now. I am like running around like a chick with my head cut off all this, this, uh, crazy craziness going on with the coronavirus. Great. So let's see if there's any other questions at the bottom here. Um, Arnold wants to know, is, there, is it possible to get a negative number when, when checking? No, Arnold, something is wrong. You can email me about that if you, if, if you still have questions. Um, let's see. I mean contraction joint and construction joint. So the question was, he really wants to know what the difference is between a construction joint, dilation joint, and expansion joint. So I would say that a, a construction joint is something, or a cold joint, is something that, that the contractors are putting in place because they need to end work for the day. You can put where you want those to be on the plan sets, but sometimes those just happen different places. So dilation slash expansion joints are things that you put in your structure where you know that that structure is going to move. So it's your responsibility to allow that to move and design for that movement and make sure that that movement is not going to cause your structure to fail. So again, it's your responsibility to do that and to provide details for that to happen. That's a lot to ask sometimes of structural engineers because a lot of them, I mean, it's very complicated. Structures are very complicated because we have something called restraint. This is how held, how tightly held the concrete is. We have some good estimates usually of how much the concrete's going to move, but we don't necessarily know how tightly held it is, how restrained it is. And so that is sometimes challenging for people to calculate and estimate. The best advice I would give you is to look at past projects and see it how other joints and other details have performed in those projects and learn from there. So a question, here's a question. Um, 
in my opinion, what's the most important issues you should address to make concrete, if not better, or a game changer in concrete? Um, I think <laughs> the biggest thing that I would tackle in concrete is tensile strength. If I could, if you can increase or improve the tensile strength of concrete, then you will drastically improve the performance of that material. Now, you need to be you need to do that in such a way that it's not going to make it cost way more, not going to make it a lot less sustainable, um, not going to make it a whole lot harder to build, and that is a tall order. I personally think that fibers are a very powerful way to do this. And I think that they will be used way more in the future. I, I really do. I think I have seen in some of my most recent research, and I'm gonna make videos about it coming up, that fibers are extremely powerful where you care about cracks. If you don't care about cracks, then maybe you don't care about fibers because that's really what I think fibers are good for, keeping cracks small. There are some benefits of having them reduce other other rebar inside your, your, your concrete structures. I think that um, research is still ongoing, but I do think keeping cracks small are extremely powerful for fibers. Now, the other thing that I would say that would be a big time game changer would be durability. If you can improve the durability of concrete to make it last a whole lot longer than what it, it commonly does now, that would be amazing. The other big game changer is constructability. If we can make our structures easier to build, easier for people to evaluate that what they're placing and what they're doing meets specification and it is long lasting, that is extremely powerful. And I'm focusing a lot of my efforts on that, on really focusing on these early age measurements to figure out and, and project into the long-term future. I'm, I'm doing that with the super air meter, with something called the Phoenix that I talked about in, in, in the last live stream, uh, with in embedded sensors, that is where I think is is something that I'm trying to make a big difference in. And also um, fibers and also durability. So those are the areas, but I'm probably biased because that's the kind of stuff that I work on. Uh, making the CO2 footprint of concrete a lot smaller would be amazing. But when you use 6 billion cubic meters of something, 6 billion cubic meters of something every year, you're going to have a carbon footprint. So if we can make that stuff last a long, long, long time, then we're going to really ease that carbon footprint over time. And so I think there are some things you can do with um, green cements, um, but I, I think that we need to use all these things together to um, improve our concrete and make it last longer over time. Uh, hey, thank you so much. Glad, glad you enjoyed my videos. I appreciate you, Rakesh. So here's a question. Are you familiar with external continuous insulation on buildings and how to calculate their load and support? So that's, that's a good question. Um, so there, there are, um, most people don't do that. Um, most people assume that those type of systems, um, those stay in place form type systems don't provide any strength or stiffness. And that's probably a good assumption. Um, in, unless there's some data out there that shows differently. Um, I think that these these things are, are somewhat helpful, but I think it's hard to quantify them. A lot of times in structural engineering, if you try to look at like cladding or anything else that's on the outside of the building and what kind of support um, it actually provides, unless you know exactly how it's built, unless you know exactly how the loads are transferred. So that would be taking the construction of those um, those stay in place forms to a much, much higher level, then um, I don't think we can really count on them or know what they're going to be able to do. So until, until people are willing to do that, then I think they're going to be continued to be ignored. So I'll tell you what, I am going to take about five more minutes of questions and then that is going to be it. Um, Here's a question. In my experience, are composite materials being used more so in the U.S. over and above traditional techniques such as steel plates and member enlargement? Um, so composite members have been used for a long time. Um, and I think you're talking about like composite materials like fiber reinforced polymers, I think is what you're talking about. 
over and above traditional techniques of steel plates and member enlargement. So FRP is used, this FRP, what's FRP? First of all, that is a um, fiber reinforced polymer rebar. It's a rebar made up of, or a, it can be any member you can make sections or straps or whatever it's made up of very very strong fibers that can be made of lots of different things carbon fibers basalt um, plastic lots of different things and then it is a um a matrix around it that actually um, protects it that actually holds it together so <clears throat> they are used in repair applications um, they are not used that often in new construction there are places that they're used where people are concerned about uh, corrosion, but some of the big concerns about those systems are <coughs> creep, fire, and actually reducing crack size, actually their stiffness. Um, I've got a video on this, at least where I talk about the one with stiffness. Um, the, and also ductility is another thing that people have to watch out for. That's, those are four pretty big ones. And I guess cost, um, is another one. And then long-term performance, there's another one. Um, and they're different. Yeah, they're different. That, that scares people because they're different. So there's quite a few things that are going against those systems. I think once those systems become inexpensive and, um, well, and what's inexpensive? I don't even think they have to become inexpensive. I think once they truly have equal performance to steel rebar, I think people will be used to you will get into using them. I think carbon fiber is the best bet. And I think if people can produce carbon fiber reinforcement, from what I've seen so far, the cost will be very high, extremely high, but I think that has the most promise. And as you produce in more and more volume, the cost will go down and it will become more prevalent. You will see carbon fiber used in much more industries before ours first. But I think once people do start using it in other industries, I think it will make it way its way into the civil world. So there you go. Um, let's see. Gentleman wants to have more videos on structural analysis. Um, I could. Um, I usually teach videos about stuff that I'm teaching or stuff that I'm researching. And I don't really teach structural analysis and I don't reach research structural analysis. But maybe in the future I, I could make some. Uh, let's see. David wants to know, how do we learn um, structural design from home? besides my videos and resources. Let's see, David. Um, uh, let's see, other books, especially when it comes to design. Um, there's a book by McCormick. I think I'm spelling his name right. McCormick. Oh, you can't see it, can you? Um, that that is uh, pretty good. He he's a, a pretty good author. Um, Nielsen. He's a gentleman I mentioned earlier for pre-stressed concrete. He also has a book in um, reinforced concrete. And then there's a gentleman named Jim White, um, who's at the University of Michigan. Um, those are kind of the three, as far as my concern, tip-top concrete books. And I would probably rank them in this order. That's not because. Um, but they all have different strengths. Um, and I thought about doing a video about this, talking about the different books, what I like about the different books that are out there. I like McCormick because it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy to do. Um, it makes a lot of sense. He's got a lot of great examples in there. And I think he does do the best dealing with design, true design. Um, Nielsen is the one that's kind of um, in the middle. He's got some very nice things in there um, as well. And um, White is the most advanced of, of the three. He has some very nice flow charts in the book that kind of walk you through and, and talk, you about, talk to you through about the decision-making process w w when it comes to design. But in my opinion, that's not really what design is. Design is getting a feel for the structure, a feel for what's going on a feel for the behavior that you're interested in and learning how to control that. And if you wanted very advanced topics, White is about the only book out there that covers those very advanced topics. Um, I think McCormick is getting better at that, um, but White was the only game in town. So there you go, those are the books. Yeah. 
Mr. Russell here wants to know about stair design. Um, I have never done stair design. Um, if I was going to design stairs, this is how I would do them. He's talking about concrete stairs. Um, this is how I would do them. I would basically, and and this I, this may be wrong, okay, um, but this is this is what I would do. If I have stairs, I am going to have a um, beam or a support that goes underneath those concrete stairs. So I'm going to actually envision, I'm going to ignore everything here. I'm going to ignore all of the, um, <coughs> I can't remember the names, the, the landings or whatever. I'm going, to mimic, I'm going to ignore them. Ignore, act like they're not even there. Act like they don't do anything. And I'm going to use this as like a diagonal beam. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put my loads on it, my point loads on it. Okay. Um, I'm going to put that on that beam. I'm going to find out where my tension is, which it should be on the bottom. I'm going to put enough steel in that region to protect it uh, or to, to design for the load. I'm going to design it as a diagonal beam with some kind of loading on it like this. Now, when it comes to actually reinforcing the stairs, um, I'm going to make, do something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to still put my steel in the bottom that I designed. You can't see what I'm drawing. I'm going to still put my, my steel in the bottom that, that I designed, that we talked about before. So I'm still going to put steel down here, but I'm probably going to put a lot more steel in my structure. So I'll put steel down here at the bottom. But I'm definitely going to put steel here at every corner. I'm definitely going to put steel here to stop the diagonals from cracking. And depending on what the structure looks like, or depending on what I'm concerned about, I may put even more steel on it than that. I may put some kind of um, bent bars here to hold these, these bars in place. Um, so that is kind of the concept. And, and you could use something like strut and tie modeling to do that, but I wouldn't. I would probably just think of it and envision it as this inner beam, and then I would put enough extra steel around it to um, reinforce where I think the problems are going to be. And again, I would pay attention to the dia these areas where I think a crack might form. I would reinforce the corners because I don't want them to chip, and that's why I would put that rebar in there. And then I need some kind of bar to hold that rebar in place. So that may end up looking very, very complicated. That system may end up looking very complicated in, in how you tie it and what, what, it, what it looks like. Um, but that's kind of the system that I would approach to design the stairs. So, so with solving for T-beams, which A do we use during the fee check? The, you will use the A that applies to that structure. So in a um, T-beam, if your A is only in the top flange, If your A is only up here, then that is the A that you will use. If you will have a case two where you have your compression fibers are in the top flange and in the web, then you will use whatever A that is to do your, your calculation. Hey, thanks for saying hi from Belgium. Appreciate that. <coughs> Rakesh wants to know, they can't pour the slab continuously. They usually use a joint at L over three. What's my comment? Um, so, Rakesh, the, the thought with that is I, I assume we're talking about an elevated slab. Um, and if you have a column coming up here and a column coming up here, we have a column over here and a column over here and a column and a column, column. He's saying if they have to put a joint here, they usually put that at L over 3. L over three. And now the reason why they do that, Rakesh, is because if you look at the moment diagram in the, those systems, um, 
bless me. If you look at the moment diagram in that system, then the inflection point or the point where there's um, zero compression and tension is pretty close to L over three. Um, that's usually about where it's at. And I, I think that's a fine estimate um, where to put, put that joint. Gentleman asked, can I name some methods to use of rusted reinforcement? So I think it depends on how much rust you have on your reinforcement. If, if it's all about section area, if you have not lost a large amount of section area, um, as in if you hold up the bar, if you could hold up the bar next to another bar and you can't really see any change in, in section area, then I wouldn't change anything at all. I would treat it just the same. If you have lost some cross-sectional area on that bar, a significant amount, then you need to estimate it and you would use that reduced cross-sectional area in your calculations. Uh, let's see. Can I answer three more questions and that'll be it? Um, David wants to know how does creep affect the structural design of, um, oh, the structural design. I think, are you talking about of FRP, David, or are you talking about of concrete in general? I, I assume you're talking about um, FRP. Um, well, I guess I'll answer two different ways. First of all, assume you're talking about FRP. So when we design our anything, um, we expect it to be able to hold load, or some kind of load for a long, long period of time. If a system like a um, rebar is under load and if it creeps, creeps means it deforms and constantly moves under load, then that means your structure will continue to move, although you didn't add any extra load to it. And if it keeps creeping, keeps creeping, keeps creeping, then it can eventually fail. A perfect example of this, of why this is horrible, is if you have um, stuff that is in tension, which oftentimes we have things that are in tension, that they do creep. Um, like, for example, like in the big gig, that was a massive project in um, Boston. They had some roof anchors. So in the roof, they actually drilled in some holes they actually cast in anchors, um, so some steel rods. They cast in steel rods, and they glued and they injected epoxy in those. Now, I'm not saying epoxy is the same thing as FRP. I'm not saying it's the same thing. This is just an example of creep. And over time, with um, an outside load on that system, this thing gave way, gave way, gave way, gave way, and eventually let go. It kept moving, 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 moving until it, 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 it actually collapsed. Now, if I have a um, reinforced concrete beam, reinforced concrete beam, and if that beam has a load on it, and if that beam is cracked, then across that crack, if we could zoom in there across that crack, going to have the bottom of the beam, we're going to have a crack, and across that crack, we're going to have our FRP, or let's just say reinforcement, across that crack. So on either side, the same thing, the same thing as this is going to be happening, the exact same thing on either side. Because there's load on that system, there will be tension down there, and that member will be pulled in tension. So I'm going to try to draw the bottom of the member. I'm going to try to draw the crack coming up. This is the bar coming across here. And that bar is going to have a constant tension on it over and over and over and over again. The same thing is going to happen. This is going to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, keep deflecting, keep deflecting over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. People don't like that. People don't like that in their structures where they have continuous load on them. Now, if there's a system that doesn't have this situation, um, that, that isn't going to have continuous load on them or be used a lot, then this could be a good application for it. So I'm going to see if there's any more. Does concrete work? Uh, okay, column design. Column design's coming. Um, you got to just be pay attention, uh, or I'm sorry, be patient. Column design is going to come next week. Yeah. Hey, 
Go to bed, Roger. Take care, man. Thanks a bunch, everybody. Hayden wants to know how to have the lowest number of stirrups possible. Um, we will talk by email. So I asked, answered David's question. Moment redistribution in concrete beams. And this will be my final thing that I talk about. Um, moment redistribution in concrete beams. So moment re re redistribution is um, something that we use, at least the term that I use for that for is to explain things that we use in structural analysis um, <coughs> to redistribute moments in different places. Now, when we redistribute moments, we assume that the stiffnesses are constant. Now, in a reinforced concrete system, as you start to load that system again and again and again, the system will crack more and more. We talked about that earlier in the live stream. And as it cracks, it's going to change the stiffnesses of the different systems. And so the system will redistribute again. Now, this might make your mind kind of want to explode and make you maybe not under understand what, what's, what, what's happening. Um, but really what it comes down to is that you don't need to worry about moment redistribution in continuous reinforced concrete beams. They're going to happen. The estimates and they are estimates when you do structural analysis the estimates you make in structural analysis are just fine and the actual moments that the structure sees in real life will be a little bit different than what you estimate in structural analysis but it kind of goes back to what i said in strut and time modeling earlier if you envision a way that the structure can handle the loads if you can envision a way that the structural system can handle the loads, and if you provide it the capacity to do that, then the structural system will find a way to do that. This is a concept called structural resiliency. I've got a video about it. You can watch it. You can see what's going on. It is one of the secrets of structural engineering. It is one of the ways that truly you can understand very complex behaviors and make them very simple if you truly understand structural resiliency. So I recommend you watch the video. I also recommend you, you look up and study something called energy methods. And again, energy methods is another way to kind of understand what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is for enough energy that you put into the system, if you've given the system enough capacity to handle that energy, everything will be okay, at least as far as life safety goes. It doesn't mean about cracking, but as far as life safety goes. Thanks everybody, this has been fun. This is my longest uh, live cast to date. I had a good number of people here that I hope I answered some of your questions. If I didn't, if you could answer, if you could um, email me offline, I'll do my best to answer them. Take care everybody, bye.